Hello everyone, and welcome to What Color is Slow? The Art of Developing a Visual Language in Games. My name is Sarah Grissom. Uh, I've been a visual effects artist since 2010. Um, I've got like five ship titles under my belt, including um, Shadow of Mordor, State of Decay HD, Age of Empires Online. Um, and I'm currently working on Spider-Man uh, with uh, the folks in Insomniac Games. And I'll be moderating the panel. Um, and these are my lovely panelists, but they'll introduce themselves. And we'll start with Tina. Hey, um, my name is Tina, or Christine Honorby. I work in Effectsville. I am not directly able to say what I'm working on right now, um, but I've been in the game industry for almost 10 years. And I have a bunch of shit done. I guess the most recent one I can say is uh, about X. Oh, oh, yeah, lots, breaking, lots, of blood. lots of things breaking. <laughs> uh, my, my name's Brianna, and I'm currently um, an effects artist at Volition, um, out in Champaign, Illinois. Oh, Hi, uh, ooh, oh, 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 hey. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't have a shot anymore. Yeah. Um, but my, my name is Brianna, and um, I work at Volition right now. I'm a senior effects artist there. Um, we just announced our most recent game at uh, E3, which is a use of Mayhem, and it's a really exciting project. Previously, I worked on Elder Scrolls Online, and I've done more than just VFX. I was at Disney Interactive for a while doing character animation. And I got I started at Effectsville, um, so I did a couple contracts with them. So I'm really excited to be here. Thank you all for showing up. Hi, my name is Eric Greenleaf. Um, I'm an effects artist at Bungie, um, working on Destiny. And, and uh, it's it's interesting that, that you mentioned that um, you didn't start out as an effects artist. I know very few people that started out as an effects artist. Um, and and it's, it's interesting that, that everybody kind of comes in from different directions. But anyway, uh, I've been doing, I've been in the games industry for 18, 19 years, something like that. I've, um, Done specifically visual effects for I think it's about nine years, something like that. I can't remember. Um, anyway, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is going to be a, a fun little panel. Um, and, uh, I do have to do. All right, thanks. Um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to outline the goals of this panel. Uh, number one would be to explain the role of VFX artists uh, in the game development process. Uh, we are kind of a, a rare breed of people. A lot of people, like you said, don't start off as effects artists. I did, but not everyone can be that special. <laughs> and, uh, I also want to outline uh, common art and design challenges, uh, discuss solutions VFX artists come up with, and answer the question, what color is slow? Uh, and finally, I wanted to continue the discussion of the visual of, uh, of a visual language, uh, raise new questions, uh, propose new solutions, and expand on the discipline of the effects at large. All right, let's get started. So, what is a visual effects artist? What do we what do we do for a game? Um, uh, I kind of wanted to go uh, give this to my panelists again to, to have them explain kind of what their duties are. Um, and I'm, oh, I've also got a couple of videos here. Uh, one is Destiny without VFX, and then Destiny with VFX. But we'll go ahead and start with Tina talking about what it is that she, what are her responsibilities while I'm that stuff. So I like to think of myself as a problem solver. Um, I can more easily say what I don't do than what I do. Um, but usually it's particle effects, spells, uh, magic, smoke, fire, blood splatters. Um, that's what I do. <laughs> if something needs to get done and animation can't cover it and uh, environment can't, can't cover, cover it, it, it yeah. I, it will probably be effects. <laughs> this is without the effects. Um, you can see that everything's working um, for the most part. Everything is is still it's still a game. Um, it, it's interesting. This is actually just primarily without particle effects. Par yeah, have, just particle effects. It has other shaders and things like that. Yeah. yeah let's go ahead and look at. So th this is the same thing with VFX. 
and it's, it's the exact same gameplay. Um, and, and it's interesting, and this is, this is one of the things I always like to touch on, is that visual effects here um, is really a communicator. Um, you, you wouldn't understand what was going on in this firefight right here if you, know, if you didn't have visual effects. You didn't understand, hey, where am I getting hit by a sniper? Or why am I taking damage? Um, you know, like this right here. Like, I mean, imagine that without without visual effects. There's just no communication going on. Um, and I think visual effects is, is one of our primary jobs is is really just to communicate things, whether it's a feeling or something more specific, um, like hey, I'm taking damage over here, or this is the place that you stand, or something like that. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But you, you can see from those two videos kind of what what kind of impact visual effects has. It's, it's not just the frosting on the cake. It, it, it's an integral part of, of the games that we do. Thank you, guys. I like to think of what we do as having a spectrum. Um, on the one hand, you have uh, practical effects. Uh, Keith Garrett from Naughty Dog uh, had a really good video about this for, I think it was a video for Full Sail. <laughs> Um, and he called them narrative effects. Uh, I'll give you some quick examples of what I mean by this, and um, panelists are free to jump in if they won't have anything to add, but it'll be pretty quick. Weather effects, kind of like what Tina was talking about, rain, snow, blowing dust, sandstorms, floating pollen, ambient effects that give your setting some movement and life. Uh, this effect is from a game called Rain. Gore, human blood, zombie blood, alien, animal, could be yarn or stuffing or other giblets. Uh, it could be decals on the ground, decals on the character, material changes on the character. This example is from uh, State of Decay. Destruction, these can be explosions, impacts, collapses, anything that blows up, splashes, bursts, gets crushed. Uh, this is a helicopter explosion from Just Cause 3, and that game is like, it's like 80% destruction effects. <laughs> Fire or any other elemental, uh, smokestacks, waterfalls, ceiling drips, fog. This example is from Tomb Raider. Just like weather effects, uh, these also provide ambient movement for your environment, but they also communicate some pretty valuable information to the player as well. Uh, this effect is telling the player that they can't enter here, that it's dangerous, that they should act swiftly but carefully. Uh, in addition to gating, they can also draw your attention. So if you think about like a torch or a campfire in a dark area, for example. So practical effects are firmly grounded in the game's reality, and they're usually elemental, environmental, or in some way physical. They're meant to be seen by the in-game characters uh, and not just the user or player. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got symbolic effects. And these are a little bit more complicated, so I have a couple more examples for you. Symbolic effects can be used to emphasize user interface elements, like this example from Kingdom Hearts 2. Uh, the triangle icon was created by a UI artist, but the triangular effect over the top of it was definitely one of us. They can also highlight actual gameplay systems, uh, tell the player what to do or what they should do. This is an example from an online trading card game called Hex Shards of Fate. It's a highly representational game relying on VFX to literally draw lines from one acting card to another. The colors and shapes and animations of these lines or even just highlights of cards are all really meaningful in the information that they're conveying to the player. Symbolic effects aren't usually um, representative of what the in-game character is actually looking at so much as they are a tool for the player or user. Assassin's Creed has a mechanic called Eagle Vision, where the player can identify uh, targets or other people of interest with red or yellow outlines. This is a symbolic effect in that it's not really grounded in reality. Uh, we're not going to assume that Ezio is actually seeing red dudes and yellow dudes uh, it's just a representation of his special assassin training. The same can be said for this example from Splinter Cell. 
This effect is called last known position. Um, an outline of your character is left behind and tells you, the player, um, where the enemy last saw you. We aren't led to believe that there is actually a little hollow Sam Fisher hanging out in the hallway. Okay, so quick summary. Uh, symbolic effects are communicated to you as the player, as opposed to practical effects, which are communicated to you and the in-game character. Uh, they sometimes display stats, numerical info, they highlight gameplay elements and interactables, and are a lot of the time iconographic in nature, uh, relying on abstract or geometric shapes. And as you can see, there's a bit of a gap here, um, and that's because there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of effects that are both practical and symbolic, and we'll take a look at a couple of examples. Guild Wars 2 and other MMOs uh, like it um, have a multitude of effects that toe the line between a display of the game's systems and a display of the game's setting or lore. Uh, it's very important for effects to be very accurate in scale, duration, and intensity that the design calls for, but it's equally important that it fits within the fantasy of the game. This example is from Shadow of Mordor. Uh, it's called Domination, and it conveys a very significant core gameplay mechanic, but it's also very grounded in the reality of Middle-earth. The entire suite of effects is very homogenous, uh, and it all serves the central character and his ghosty, elfy superpowers. This example is from Final Fantasy X. It's a spell called Haste. Uh, you could make the argument that this uh, effect is purely symbolic because it's pretty iconographic, it describes a gameplay system, but I'd argue that it's somewhere in between practical and symbolic um, because mages can cast all kinds of spells, fire, thunder, haste, things like that. Um, the distinction for me is whether or not the in-game character can see this effect or not, um, but, I mean, debates can be had. You can have that debate with your art director. As this is a spectrum, we can place some of these examples further toward practical, like Shadow of Mordor, or further toward symbolic, like Final Fantasy. But the one thing they all have in common is communication, and what it is they're trying to communicate to the player, and how they're trying to do that. Um, yeah. So, uh, slow. As a gameplay mechanic, is a perfect example for demonstrating a game's visual language. It's a video game standard. Thousands of games have this mechanic or some version of it. So what color is slow? All right, we're going to start with Brianna this time. All right. So my answer is kind of a nonsense answer. Um, I say that slow is a movement, first and foremost, and that color is secondary to movement. Um, basically, a lot of this is, uh, it, it has to do with what kind of slow you're doing. Um, so the example GIF I have in there is from a game called Amplitude by Harmonix. And um, in this game, there's a, a mechanic for slow called sedate, and it's actually, in this case, it's a buff. Like, you want to use sedate so that you can slow down time a little bit so you can hit the notes um, easier in this game. And, you know, a lot of times when we think about slow, we think of it as like a bad thing or like a negative mechanic. Um, and in those cases, you know, you might want to use red or um, an, an easy color like yellow. There's a really good um, color theory book that I've been reading called uh, If It's Purple Then Someone's Gonna Die. And it's, it's a really, really good book if you're, um, if you're interested in that kind yeah, of color you're, theory stuff. You're dressed in purple. I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to scoot over now. <laughs> oh, um, but I, I think it's um, it's really important whenever you're trying to convey slow to um, actually have some kind of like slowness in that. Like if you're a particle effects artist, like you can have um, you know your particles moving more slowly. Ideally, you'll also get some animation support. Um, our our discipline, like we we have to work with other disciplines like animation, um, especially when we're messaging this kind of thing. And what we do kind of goes on top of it. Basically, um, your, your eye is going to pick up on movement way more than it does color, and color shouldn't be the only thing you're using to message it either. Like, whatever you do needs to be able to be read by colorblind folks, right? Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my nonsense on answer, so it's not a color. Okay. Uh, thank 
you. And we'll move on to Tina. Um, so off the top of my head, I think of slow as being something desaturated and dull, the opposite of something fast and speedy and vibrant. If I was asked to make a slow effect with no context of the game involved, the first thing I would probably think to do would be to make a screen effect that desaturates the screen. Um. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, well, desaturation is often used in games. Yeah. In, when in these examples, examples. You can well, see the screen is desaturating. Yeah. Or you know, it's not it's not as full of contrast as, as it is normally. Totally. Um, Interestingly enough, though, these, while there is a slow being conveyed in these examples, it's actually the world that's being slowed, not the player. Um, the player's actually moving really fast in, in Stranglehold and in Max Payne. Um, that's true. It's bullet time. But regardless, saturation is conveying a change in speed and tempo. Um, and then desaturation is a visual as, as part of visual language as a whole, often deals with time and speed. Flashbacks in movies and TV are often black and white. Um, and again, it's, it's a lack of color is conveying the idea of what is going on is not of the present, or rather uh, time and velocity are not proceeding normally. And I suppose that the other reason I think of desaturation as conveying slow is because I think of saturation being fast. Red sports cars, the flash, Mario when he has a superstar, he flashes and blinks with saturation. But um, saturation, desaturation is just what I think of off the top of my head. Um, to make a good slow effect in a game, the game itself needs to be taken into account. Um, desaturation would be useless in a game. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Tina. All right, we're going to move on to Eric. So I actually, I love this question. Um, and off the top of my head, I want to think, uh, you know, I'm going to answer this question literally. And I would literally say that slow is blue. And if you think about it, um, I, I actually, I, tr I try to justify to myself, well, why is slow blue? And I have another question here in just a second, but why is slow blue? Blue. And there's actually, I, I went on a uh, quick Google search, which yeah, I never do, um, and trying to find something that would, that would kind of justify it. And, and if you think about color theory, here's, here's a, a quick explanation of uh, blue and color theory. And it literally mentions in there, it slows down, what does it say? Slows, slows human metabolism and produces a calming effect. And so, again, to answer that question, literally, um, blue is my color for slow. But let's ask another question. What is, like, what is the color of poison? When you think of poison, what is, how do we represent that in games? What, what would you say? Green. Yeah, green. Okay. Green, green is often the actual color. And it's because in games we've developed a language for that. Okay. In games and, and even film, we've developed that language. And so now we think, you know, we think about poison is green. Poison isn't actually green. I mean, poison, <laughs> what is poison? It's, it's not green. But that's kind of the association that we make with it. Um, slow is a little bit different because slow is used in a lot of different contexts. We don't have that kind of uh, visual language, that color language for slow. So to, to answer the question, uh, the color of my color obviously would be slow. But... That is a secondary question. What the, the actual question is how do you represent slow? And you represent slow in whatever way it makes sense for your game. Um, there are probably a couple of things that, that you want to communicate. Um, you, obviously, the motion that you do, let's say it's an effect for, for slowing someone down. Um, the motion is obviously going to be slow. You, you probably aren't going to use um, textures that are nice and jagged, kind of like electricity. You want you want textures that are nice and smooth, that convey that that feeling of, of smoothness. You know, the calming effect. Those are the kinds of things that you use for it. So anyway, that's my literal answer. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so for good measure, um, I compiled a bunch of other examples of slow. Blue. 
<laughs> well, actually, actually, yeah. <laughs> this is slow from League of Legends. Um, it happens on a lot of different moves, and it's the yellow tracks that are left behind. And I think Tina knows a little bit more about this than I do. Like, it's never alone. Like, slow is never right by itself. In in League, generally, well, not always, but when a slow is applied, you get the yellow tracks. There's a lot of different effects, or a lot of different spells that you can cast to slow. Mm -hmm. But the global slow is the yellow tracks. Right. It's just it's a it's like an additional element that'll happen, and it's it's almost like their decision to like unify all of the slows together. The attempt. To they attempt to do that because I know that there's a bunch of other effects that they have in there that are supposed to be slow as well that don't have these yellow tracks. So, um, yeah. So this slow is yellow tracks behind the character. Um, this is slow from Final Fantasy X. And it looks a bit like the haste example that I used before, which makes sense. Haste is speeding up and slow is slowing down. Um, but it's more on the cooler side of the color spectrum. Uh, haste has warmer yellows and oranges and maybe like a little you know, peaches, I guess. Um, and this actually has more blue and green in it. It's a more, it's a, it's a more desaturated, cooler side of that spectrum. <clears throat> This is slow from Paragon. Uh, it kind of looks like a Fresnel material applied over the whole of the character. It's not a particle effect. It's not decal effect left behind. Um, and uh, a couple of coworkers of mine are actually working with this team, and they call this color ochre, specifically. But it looks orange to me. Uh, this is slow motion from Shadow of Mordor. And I actually developed this effect. It's a full screen effect, kind of like what Tina was talking about, that desaturates the entire screen. And color shifts slightly from um, everything's kind of this hot cyan. And so I color shifted it kind of slightly green. Um, it also has like a pretty heavy distortion vignette around the edges of the screen as well to kind of show that like this is not normal, this is not present time. This is a kind of slow from Quantum Break, and that game is all about time manipulation. Um, there's a lot of nuance in the effects. They use a lot of distortion, uh, a lot of uh, chromatic aberration, and they juxtapose a lot of complementary colors together. So uh, cyan and magenta, or blue and orange. And they've got a mechanic called time vision, which is just black and white. This is slow from Bloodborne. Um, there's actually no uh, visual effect associated with this. Uh, the character is just slower moving, and it happens if you're carrying something heavy or going through a swamp. And what Brianna was saying before, that it's a, you, know, you don't need a, a, a visual effect with this. You can just like make your character slower and sell it with that movement. All right. So now that we've shown you the many ways that we can present, represent one simple mechanic, uh, let's go with something a little bit more complex. I asked a friend of mine um, who's a designer at Undead Labs to provide a design challenge for the panelists. And a shout out to Brian Gianni, by the way, for his graciousness. And I'll just read it to you because it's very long. <clears throat> After an insufferably long charge up, the character executes an intricate combination of hand gestures, concluding in something projecting a windy, slow-moving force outwards. Something not inherently damaging, but morbid and seething, courses from the player into an enemy. The enemy in question is then doomed, leaving them with a guarantee of death after 10 seconds pass. But during that time, they're invulnerable and seriously juiced up, moving faster and dealing extra damage, bonus points via an increased strength stat, often causing them to go on crazy rampages before their time is at long last up. All right, so let's see what Brianna has started with. Do you want to switch with me? Okay. okay. So um, before I get into my results, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about process. Uh, how many of you in here are VFX artists? I'm just wondering. All right, a couple of you. How many of you are designers? that work with VFX artists, all right, so more of you. Um, so when I interact with a designer, like if Brian Giami wrote the spec, if I was trying to make an effect for him, um, the first thing I would do is I'd go to Brian and say, hey Brian, 
what is it you're trying to build? And Brian would be like, oh, well, it's a, an attack, like a, a status effect after that is applied after the projectile goes. Like there's a charge up, there's a channeling phase, there's a launch phase, there's a projectile, there's an impact. Um, and then there's a status effect that's all in queue before, you know, or the enemy before they die. Um, so one of the things I like to do with design is I like to ask them, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, give me the problem, don't give me the solution, because sometimes we can work together and we can get like a really good solution together. Um, and then the next thing I do is uh, I like to go and get reference. So um, I decided to like Persona 5 was one of the, the things that we had talked about is like kind of a stylistic like reference for this. So I actually haven't played that game at all. So I went on to YouTube and I, I got some clips and you know I heard Doomed and I looked at the style and it's got this really graphic style, right? Like it's got this really harsh edges, kind of more comic book like. Um, and I, I saw a lot of this black and red type stuff. And I said, hey, you know, black and red, now that's kind of cheaty for effects because it looks so good. Like, you can't you can't make an effect that's black and red that doesn't need, read doomed, right? Like, you see black and red, you think, oh, yeah, that guy is doomed. <laughs> He's going to do more damage. It looks, you know, it's a very powerful color combination. Um, and then what I like to do is I like to do a thumbnail or I like to outline, like, I have a little screenshot of my outline. Like, I kind of wrote down all the different things in there. And you can't even see it because it's so tiny, but... You know, um, just go through, kind of thumbnail your stuff, get your get your process down, and you know, talk with uh, other effects artists in your room or with the designer just to make sure you're all on the same page. Um, and then you do your base implementation. You get feedback from design and from other effects artists, and then you you know, you have your finished result, which ideally will be completely polished. It will have um, you know, you go through your optimization at that point. Like I usually don't do my full optimization pass until the end. I mean, I kind of try to be conscious of overdraw as I work. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of the, the main thing for the end. Um, I want to emphasize that a better process will get you a better result. I think a lot of people skip the reference stuff. And that's a huge mistake. You should never assume that you know what fire looks like. You know, you should never assume that, I mean, a rock quarry explosion is going to look way different than a car explosion, but it's going to look way different than, you know, like a little firework on the ground. It's really important to get reference for whatever it is you're working on before you start. Um, so here's, here were some of my results. I um, made these in Unreal 4. Um, so basically what we have is uh, there's like a channeling effect at the start. And usually when you have a channeling effect, you'll kind of concentrate on the hands. Like there'll be some kind of animation, you know, like you're, you're building up energy. I've got black in there. I tried to make it feel, um, get that more graphic look that Persona has. And then uh, I put some like red sparks in there. And then for the burst effect, for the launch, for the projectile, like there's more of a like a burst that kind of indicates direction, right? Um, and so at that point, once you have that, um, you launch the projectile. I don't actually have it moving, I just have it kind of standing there. But I actually read that more like windy, so I have a more windy projectile, <laughs> not windy. And that's one of the reasons why you need to go to design and be like, hey, design, like, uh, you know, this says, is this windy? Is this windy? You know, what is it, uh, what is it that you want? Because, I mean, you can read a spec, and you can, uh, you know, it's really easy to misinterpret it. It's really important to get out of your desk at work if you can, or just, you know, hit someone up on Skype and be like, hey, you know, what, what are you thinking for this? Like, here's some, like, here's some reference I found. You think this matches for what it is you're going for. Um, so I have some black and red in there again, and it's very dark black. Like, this is a, um, it's a really dense material, right? Because I'm kind of going for that whole solid comic book look. Um, and then the, the last part, I didn't actually do this in Unreal because I didn't know how to get material effects working correctly. So this is a, a previs I mocked up in Photoshop. And um, for the status effect itself, um, I wanted to have something in there that was uh, kind of a, a material on the player because like shader hit flashes are really a really good way to like uh, make something read instantly for the player, right? Like if you see like your guy flashing and there's like a light on the ground and um, you know, you have a, like I have like kind of these light rays coming out. Um, and the whole the whole black and red theme is like really solid for it too. Um, but I kind of imagine that this would go on for the 15 seconds and you know at the at the end of it it would probably like increase in pace, you know, it would be like we make a lot of sound effects in VFX. If you're working with VFX artists, you know that. We tend to, we tend to yeah, it's, it is absolutely true. Um, but you know, it'll, and then at the end of it, like ultimately they're, they're gone. But if you want to make it read like they're going to be doing more damage and they're invulnerable, 
like you need to like go all out for that. Like you need a, a material effect, you need a light, and you need to, you know, have some colors in there that help to show that, you know, this guy is, you know, he's doomed, but he's doing more damage, and red and black is a really good theme for that. So, yeah, that's where that's where I'm at. Thank you. All right, so we're going to start with the cast. Do you want to talk about that? Right, uh, so in the design document, the cast was supposed to take a, a long charge up time. So I wanted to show a building up of power and energy. And it's so cool. And I, it's, yeah, I feel red and black do a good job of, of conveying the feeling pure so. coincidence, by the way. They didn't talk about right? it. Right? I know, yeah. I found it interesting that Brianna chose red and black as well. Um, Do you want me to switch to this? Yeah, I, I, I think it is also important to note that if animation was involved, the guy would be doing hand gestures, and I might have taken a, a different route. It, so it, um, we as effects artists don't work in a vacuum, so it is really important to work with the other departments because <laughs> You can make a lot of something a lot cooler when you work with animation as opposed to yeah. just doing that. Yeah, like if you wanted to have something like this, like that's kind of really static, but the hand gesture is something with, exactly. like it's kind of hard to pull yeah. that off. And uh, sometimes, like I, I, I go with the assumption that they like that animation, but sometimes they don't. Like they're right. like, no, I don't, don't right. worry, change. Like if you have a cool idea, you know, we're all trying to make a better game. Exactly. Yeah. So this is yeah, just my solution for. As a static situation. Cool. Alright, I don't go with mis missile. Yes. Um, so it's either windy or windy. <laughs> either one. Um, I did feel uh, red and black was a good morbid sort of feel. Um, if you guys want to see uh, after the presentation what this looks like on a really good monitor, because it's Amazing. A lot better than little projectors. <laughs> um, I think the trail creates an undulating, windy or windy motion. Both of more windy. Both have both. Yeah, windy yeah they go both. <laughs> and for the hit, I wanted to um, show that the hit was infecting the victim and use the same swirly shape as it goes down. Next slide. Um, the enemy debuff is supposed to take place for 10 seconds. Um, so I wanted to show a build up in that effect over time, and um, I feel like the speeding up of the sparks helps to show that something's impending. The red on the character <laughs> 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 um, helps to show um, the increase of red helps to show that he's juiced up and he's going berserk, um, and. Uh, I feel also the red might help to convey an increased strength stat. Right. Like he's more yeah. powerful. Angry. Yeah. And then he's just going to blow up. He's doomed. And then I think I've got the one that's all together. Oh. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and let this play a couple of times because it's sweet. Thank you, Tina. Yeah, thank you. All right, Eric, if you want to swap with me. Sure. So yeah, um, like Korean, I want to talk a little bit about process. And um, I, I, it's really important, um, as we said earlier, uh, to do a lot of communication with the designers, with the art director, um, and with the animators. And as we go through this, uh, as we get into to how I actually solved this problem, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But I, I think that's probably one of the, the most important things is, is to communicate with the designer and see what they want to communicate with the player. Uh, as we mentioned early on, um, a, a 
huge thing that an effects artist does is communicates to the player. And so you need to get to the root, like Brianna said, you need to get to the root of what they want to communicate to the player. So that's, that's a very important thing. Then I usually sit down and do some brainstorming, figure out a theme for this particular effect, how it fits within the language of the other effects that, you, that you've done in the game. Um, go through and do some experiments, see what kind of cool things you can come up with, just you know, not specifically related. Um, and then, uh, again, as Brianna said, uh, definitely get some reference in these things. Then the first thing, just so that the designer can get in there and continue to work on their work, you don't want to block the designer. You want to make sure that they have something to um, do this particular spell, make sure it works properly in the game, whatever they're doing. You want to make sure that they're not blocked. So you go ahead and deliver them something that basically meets the requirements of, of what they want to do. Um, so that's usually the first step. Um, and then, this is one of the things that we do at Bungie a lot, is we sit down and we let that thing cook. You know, we we'll usually, once we deliver that uh, initial thing where it's, okay, it's functional for the design, what they can do what they need to do with it, sit down and let that cook for maybe a week or two, maybe even longer than that, and see what happens because, um, things change. They might say, wow, now we don't need to do that, you know, he's not going to do this motion, whatever happens there. They need the time to figure that out, you don't want to block them. So we sit, we, we let, let that thing cook for a while in the game. Then once they, once they come fairly close to, to the final, you know, final, right? Once they come to, the, to <laughs> what they really think is, is going to be the essence of, of what this thing's going to happen, is we'll go ahead and create uh, what we call a, an art functional. And that is, um, it's more than just placeholder in there. It's, it's essentially what we're going to have. It has all the components that you want to put into that effect. Okay. Um, so it has all the components. It's not the final. If you know it still has some placeholder things in there, but it communicates and it has all the components of what you need. Then again, you let it simmer. You let it sit there and you get feedback from everybody. Uh, you get feedback from the designers, you get feedback from the animators, you get feedback from anybody that plays the game. And then you take that feedback and you do some iteration on it. And eventually you're gonna, you're gonna deliver what we call the, uh, the second pass art. Okay. This second pass art could potentially be shipping and on disk. Okay, so you need to bring it to a certain point where it's in there, it's final enough, you're always going to want to do more tweaks and changes to it, but you really want to deliver something that, that communicates it and, it and it's up to the quality bar that, that it could potentially ship. Okay. Uh, and then obviously after that you're going to do a lot of polish. That's going to depend on how much time you have, how many other things you have to do. But this is, this is really the process that, that we usually go through at Bungie um, uh, for effects and, and for other uh, similar things. And then I think the two most important things in there are let it cook and let it simmer. Because that designer needs the time to figure out what they're going to do. Okay? You don't want to hold them up. So you need to deliver to them what they need and let them work through it. So for, for my actual... Um, uh, for the results for this design problem. I kind of treated this as if I were to um, come up with the, the, the design for the effect and hand it off to one of my VFX artists. Um, I would also use this kind of this kind of process when I'm talking to the designer. I will sit down and, you know, we'll sit down sometimes for 10, 15 minutes, half hour or an hour and just kind of talk about specific things and, and what will work with, you know, with them. Um, so if we look at this uh, initially, the charge up, there were some specific things in this design problem for the charge up. Um, and it, uh, let's see, one of the first things is, he specifically says an intricate combination of hand gestures. There's another thing that's in there, he says, uh, he calls it an insufferably long charge up. Obviously the designer is trying to communicate that it's something that, okay? We want to take advantage of what that communication is, okay? So what I wanted to come up with is if you have an intricate, um, you know, these intricate long hand gestures, one of the greatest, way to, greatest ways to communicate that and to really capitalize on that is what if we have ribbons that are tied to whatever that guy is doing, okay? You can sit there and, and you know, 
have these ribbons moving and you can work with the animator and have the animator kind of blow that up and so these things are very visible, you know, whatever that, whatever those hand gestures are. And that um, kind of helped me come up with a theme for this effect. And what you want to do, we, we talk about visual language a lot, um, and you want to make sure that you come up with something that is immediately identifiable. If you think of, uh, you know, in your game, in the case of, of Destiny, for example, you want to identify something, hey, that's a Vex character, hey, that's a Cabal character, or, you know, the different types of things that come up. So you really want to come up with a theme for it, and, and that's what I would, I would um, solve for the, the theme of, uh, for this problem right here, okay? So now we have a theme in there. Um, we're gonna we're gonna communicate that theme to the next uh, the next part of it, which is the projectile. And again, this is why you want to communicate with your designer. Is it windy or is it windy? When I first read this, I read windy, and then and then later we talked about it. Hey, maybe it's windy. So I took the windy and again um, moved with went with that um, and a windy slow moving force uh, and some of the. Some of the other things that, that they describe in there is something morbid, seething, coarseness. Yeah, something that is morbid, seething, courses outward from the player to the enemy. So again, it's it seems like it's slow and and seething and and kind of has this motion in it. Um, you know, and one of the things that um, uh, I did some work with uh, the SIVA effects for uh, upcoming uh, Rise of Iron, and one of the things that that we did with that is we had some really kind of motion um, things. One of the one of the ways that we accomplish that is, and I know that there are some effects artists here that'll be like, "Oh yeah, I made those." But is you take um, a bunch of these cylinders, and if you kind of offset these cylinders so that they are they're uh, slightly oblong, and then you can sit there and scale them up, you get this really cool effect of this undulating kind of orb kind of ball thing. And that's kind of what I'm going for with this. Um, so again, it's, it's something that seeds. seeds. Um, if we look at the tail of this, and I, I came up with, with something totally independent of, of Tina, again, it has kind of the, these tendrils behind it, if you, if you think of the, the Sentinel from the Matrix. You know, something, again, undulating and, and moving. Um, and there are certain techniques that you could use. Uh, you could use ribbons behind the, the projectile. Um, there's something in, in a bungee we, we use that are called tube ribbons, which is essentially a ribbon, but it's, it's, it's uh, a cylindrical ribbon. So you can get it from all different angles, and you can use Fresnel and things like that. Uh, another thing that I would use on this um, are, are probably some, uh, a lot of distortion in this, maybe even a flow map, um, if you're familiar with flow maps. Um, yeah, just to get that thing that's just kind of moving and, and sinking along behind it. Okay. So uh, the next thing we're going to look at is, is the enemy. Uh, again, we want to kind of give this the, the same visual language um, of, of these energy ribbons. Uh, and one thing that I, I thought of is that, okay, what if as this character is moving, because it, it says in the description that the character is actually going to speed up. So what if as the character speeds up, you're going you're gonna to see that motion. What if you actually had ribbons um, coming from the ground and attaching to the markers or to the sockets on that, uh, on that enemy? And so as he's walking along and, and he's speeding up, you kind of see that, that motion. And it's almost as if the, the ground is, is energizing him and, and giving him this, this buff because uh, in there it says he's actually going to get stronger. So as he's walking along, these things shoot up from the ground and grab, uh, and, and grab uh, particular parts of him. Um, if the next thing I want to do um, is what we call an object effect. Um, and what uh, Brianna is referring, referring to as a material effect. Basically, on the character, um, if you create a shell around the character, you can put additional effects on the character. And in this case, I wanted to do an object effect um, that, again, mirrored that same kind of language and had kind of that squirming, um, uh, you know, kind of ribbon-like thing on the actual character himself. Okay. The third thing that, you, that I wanted to do with this um, is there is a, a specific, I think it actually says, ten, uh, says 10 seconds. Again, we want to communicate. The designer wants to communicate that this thing starts and then it ramps up and then it ends. Okay, and we want to kind of give a sense of that timer uh, on them. 
So the timer, um, what we can do with that timer is, um, as these ribbons that are tied into the ground, you can think of those almost as like the, the Ghostbuster proton uh, effect. But as, as it, uh, at the beginning of this spell when it's affecting the character, they're kind of slow and languid. And then as it speeds up, we're showing this timer that, wow, this thing's gonna get faster and faster. And the distortion on those things are gonna get, is gonna get faster and it's gonna get stronger. Okay. So there's the speed, the intensity of that distortion on those things, and again, that's going to be communicated through the object effect as well as uh, ribbons uh, launching on the ground. Um, and then there's also going to be uh, what we call god rays, basically emanating out of the character. We, we use that we use that every once in a while with uh, in Destiny, and that you know all of a sudden this character is starting to glow, or this object is starting. Oops, sorry. This object is starting to glow, um, and, and it's 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 a fairly decent kind of blank away of, of communicating the timer is that this this uh, glow is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And then obviously there's the death. I didn't do a death. Um, I read a like Tina's death where the guy just like explodes in general. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I was what I want to do with this death death again, if we if we go with the glow, the glow essentially uh, engulfs the, the player um, and then you get I can what I can visualize here are a lot of just like teeny, teeny little ribbons. Again, if you go on little cylinders, and you can have those cylinders um, just kind of like shoot out from the character. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's important here that, that we that again you work with the designer um, and you figure out what they want to communicate, and you develop the visual language for that specific effect. And how does that visual language for that effect fit within the visual language of the rest of the game? So. I think that's all I have. Thanks, Eric. Final thoughts and takeaways. Slow is uh, whatever you need it to be. Um, I have made a slow that's desaturated. I've made slow effects that are yellow. I've made slow effects that are purple. Um, it really just depends on the game that you're making, what, what they're doing, and, and what you want to achieve. Some ideas are universal in games, uh, but rules are constantly being broken. Like he was saying, poison is green, but I've made purple poison, I've made blue poison. Um, it just kind of depends on the, on the lore that you're going for. Uh, so there's no right answer. It's just what's right for your game, for, for the visual language of your game. And um, the visual language of a game is in development for as long as the game is in development. Like you can't just have, well you can, it would be nice uh, if you had this sort of uh, an art bible or something at the very beginning that's like, nope, never deviate from this. Always, it's always gonna be this color and it's always gonna be these shapes, but you know, that's it's not really the iterative process of game development. Um, you know, it, it's, it's an ongoing process. There's a conversation to be had with you and the designers and the artists, and there's give and take. And I think that that's a really great thing about game development is you don't have to follow a strict set of rules. You can kind of figure it out as you go and um, make better games. All right, goals going forward. Uh, I kind of wanted to open this up to the panelists and maybe even other people in the room. Um, what kind of design challenges have you faced in the past? Is there something you've learned from it? Uh, is there something that you wish to see in production going forward? Do you hate iteration? Do you, would you rather have the art bible? You know, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'll just open this up to you guys. If there's anything that you want to chime in on, or if there's anybody in the audience that has a question as well. I, I, I think it's... Um... One of the great things about the panels like this, um, and, and we, we talked about this before, is that there are, if you look at the number of effects artists versus any other artists in the industry versus hard surface artists, character artists, animators, and, and things like that, the number of effects artists are, is, is very small. And the other areas of art have a lot of these languages that, that they're talking about. And effects artists were really just starting to develop those languages. Um, and, and I think, I think us going out there and, and talking about these things and figuring out, uh, you know, these these practical effects versus other kinds of effects. I think it's great for us to be able to do that and really starting to develop our own idea. So, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank you.
Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing we can sit down and like, discuss these things like that. Mm -hmm. Real-time VFX is a pretty small community, um, but we are growing. They actually, the real-time VFX group just announced that there's going to be a real-time VFX.com, like a, a hub for people like us, people like maybe you, if you want to come join us, talk about visual effects. So that's uh, that's awesome. I think that's happening like on Tuesday. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think one of the, the goals that I think I'd like to see us do going forward is get more unified terminology. I mean, some some terms are universal. Like if I say overdraw, um, any real time effects artist will know what that means. I'm like it's overdraw, bad. and yeah, and everybody everybody flinches a little bit. You know, like, <laughs> ah, no. But, I do this actually. <laughs> but um, you know, uh, there there are so many different words for um, you know what what some people call alpha clip. I've also heard alpha crush and like. Black point. I think I think it's technically a little different, but yeah. like you know, they all kind of do a similar alpha thing. threshold. Alpha threshold, and you know, we don't really have a unified term for what that yeah. is. Or soft. Yeah, or yeah. soft. Soft particles is when a particle is intersecting with geometry and it's a little bit faded down there yeah, instead. We, of, we call that depth fade. Depth fade, yeah, depth yeah, bias, depth, depth attenuation, that. soft. Like we it's don't have run text. It's a point. It's not a line. It's a spline. Oh, <laughs> it's <a> poly. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that just comes with different engines. But even even still, like uh, like particle systems, which you would think would, would kind of all be the same. It's just like points in space that you're pushing around. Like they kind of use words like velocity and speed, kind of willy nilly. Um, you know, or velocity over time, or speed over time, or, or whatever. Like, yes, acceleration. Uh, acceleration. Yeah, I feel like a, a unified, a more unified approach to that, or at least a better understanding, so that when these tools do get built, like, we can be like, no, please just call it soft. It's it's shorter. <laughs> it's easier. The, the problem with soft is a lot of times we will invert them. So if, if you <laughs> imagine those, uh, like those ribbons coming from the ground. Okay, you actually want to, that to glow where it hits that point, so you invert that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's unsolved. Blow that up. We have to call that edge detection. Yeah, yeah. We have, we have a word detection. for that, but like yep. nobody else has that word because you know we're just kind of in our effects place out in Champaign, Illinois, yeah. which is very far from here. So. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, yeah, you and then. Um. So, like, I'm a student at Clover Park for like their. Net programming, but I'm really interested in like the art aspect and also the effects aspect now. Um, where do I just go when I where I want to actually learn, start learning this stuff or practicing it? Like, what do I? Where do I go and what do I use? Uh, learning VFX. How do I learn VFX? Is a, is the question pretty much? Uh, uh, Realtimevfx.com, I think, on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, the, the, the tough thing is that there isn't a lot of resources out there for VFX yet. We're working on that as a community. I think even people are talking about doing a boot camp at GDC and kind of rallying together a little bit more, kind of like what the sound uh, uh, people are doing in games or even the animators are doing in games. Like they have their <clears throat> they have their communities and they have ways to foster this education. Um, yeah, you kind of have to just like beg, borrow, and steal the effects. Like at the very least, Unreal is free and Unity yeah. is free, and yeah. you can just start like having fun with particle effects. Um, but yeah, the 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 resources are, are pretty pretty limited aside from just trying stuff. But download Unreal or Unity. Right. Yeah. So open and maybe give it a try. Thank you. I, I do want to add um, when you're first learning real time effects, it's pretty frustrating because, I mean, you're mostly learning off of YouTube tutorials and, you know, if you're trying to learn Unreal, Unreal is very different than Unity, you know, and um, I just want to say don't get discouraged, keep trying. It will take you a long time to learn how to make real-time effects because there's a lot to learn. I mean, you have to learn about shaders, you have to learn about particles, you have to learn about materials. Um, sometimes, I mean, I'll go in and I'll do uh, our equivalent of Blueprint, you know, learning how to set up simple scripts and Blueprints so you can trigger your particle systems, and um, there's a lot of things that you need to touch on, um, but don't don't stop trying. Don't stop learning, even even if you think you got this a lot. Like there's always new techniques, there's always new uh, technology out there, um, and even like older techniques. Like I know a lot of people were like traditional animation is dead, and like I do plenty of traditional animation in three D AAA effects work. 
you know, um, never stop learning. Even you'd be surprised as as to what is actually relevant to this job. Um, you know, we have people that come in from film. We have people who come in from animation or environment art. People who are technical <coughs> artists. People who are scripters, programmers. Uh, we have people who are geologists or went to school for psychology and just ended up here magically. You know, um, it's it's a uh, it's a job for people who love learning and trying new things. Um, we have a question over here, too. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you about, oh, speaking of language, that boom moment when the casting is done, like we saw both of me. It's when the camera, it looks like you chase, but I think it's a distortion that you're creating with the sphere. I'm not sure how you do it. The one I. Uh, on both animation, on the spell goes out, there's a moment the camera moves in a way. I think it's a distortion. Yeah, yeah. Animation. I you used to use that. Did you hear me? Was it a camera? No, it, it was a, oh. it was distort, distortion on, or on a, on a sphere that was expanding. Um, so I, I had a distortion too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what that was. Yeah. I wanted to ask you. Well, I think it's super important to really mark that moment when something comes out, right? So I just wanted to hear some tips on, like, for example, how you do it or what's the right moment to let it go. Do you use like normal music template to figure out when the moments gotta come out? Or? It, 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 I think it's real, very interesting. Um, and, and you mentioned like the principles of animation. The principle of animation definitely apply here. You need to have it. It is very much like a rhythm of the effect. Um, it, you know, you have to be able to sit down and imagine how that thing plays out. Uh, you know, we said earlier we do kind of a lot of sound effects with it. And and when you you go in there, you know. Shoo, shoo, like this, you do a lot of that at work, and, and you have to. It's almost like you have to time it out. Okay, it's and then it, it's like that. That's what you do. You kind of feel how that thing goes, how it goes, and you sit down and you play it and you play it, and it's like, oh, that's that, that timing doesn't feel right. It, it, it's it's all about the feeling and, and, and how that goes. It's like theater. Yes. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah, acting. Yeah, the lots of stuff is is applicable. So I, we're actually out of time, but we'll be just outside. Maybe we'll go to the lounge area or something like that if you have, want to ask us questions. Um, and if you want to see Tina's really awesome video on how to go to school, this is very cool. But thank you, everybody. Thank you.